It's Burns season, but this is not about Robert Burns, the poet. This is about Robert Burns, the exciseman. It's said that sometimes when Solway smugglers wanted to make sure they weren't going to be caught by the local excisemen, they would actually kidnap him. After snatching the hapless lawman, they would lock him up in a room with a bountiful supply of food and drink. They would only keep him captive long enough for their cargo to be safely on its way along Galloway's roads, but that would be more than enough time for the excisemen to become quite inebriated. When they fetched him out of captivity, they would blindfold him, drive him to some isolated spot, put a fat coin purse in his pocket and let him go. Perhaps not a bad way to spend a failed day's work, but definitely not a productive one. Anyway, it may doubtless surprise you that this was not the kind of lackadaisical exciseman that Rabbi was. Indeed not, because by all accounts, Burns enjoyed his work and, more importantly, was fairly good at it. Robert Burns applied to join the excise around the time that he finally married Jean Armour. The expense of training for the trade prompted him to ask unsuccessfully for an advance on his royalties. Still he must have managed to meet the costs somehow because at around the time that they bought Ellisland Farm, he began his training in Tarbolton in Ayrshire. Then the first harvest at Ellisland was not a success and Burns became a little bit desperate for his appointment to the excise to begin. But Gaining a post as an exciseman after training wasn't actually a given and there was a waiting list for them. Not only that, but a newly minted excise officer did not have a say as to where he would be posted when he finally gained a position. Robert wasn't having any of that though, so he began a letter writing campaign to ensure himself a swift and convenient appointment to the excise here in Dumfries. He actually proposed that the incumbent officer, Leonard Smith, be ousted to make way for him. He reasoned that Mr Smith was already well off and being removed could do him no manner of harm. To persuade the powers that be to take up this unprecedented plan, he penned a flattering poem that included these quite cringeworthy lines. Why shrinks my soul, half blushing, half afraid, backward abashed to ask thy friendly aid? I know my need, I know thy giving hand, I tax thy friendship at thy command. Still, it took a year for Burns to get his placement. He finally got his wished for appointment in Dumfries by September 1789 working five days a week and riding 40 miles a day for the princely sum of £50 a year. Now, only a handful of stories about Burns at work as an exciseman have actually been recorded, but one from Kirkpatrick Durham gives us a view into the kind of excise man he was. Rabbi and his supervisor went to the house of Jean Dunn, who was a suspected trader in homebrew for the Kirkpatrick Durham Gala. She was not home when they visited, only a maid and Jean's very young daughter. The maid denied any brewing had taken place, but then the child contradicted her. That's no true, the wee lassie cried. The muckle black kist is full of the bottles of yell that my mother set up all night brewing for the fair. 
response to the child's honesty, Burns declared suddenly that they were in a hurry, but that they would return later to examine the kist, which of course gave Jean time to hide the contraband. Rabbi was in fact criticised at the time of his death for his seemingly lax approach to women traders. But it was common for by brewers like Jean to exist. They were supposed to pay duty ahead of time, although if they, they sold more than the duty they had paid, they would be in trouble. Brewing at home for personal use though was completely legal. The most famous and well-documented event in Burns' excise career concerned a ship called the Rosamond. The smuggling brig was sighted stranded at Sackfoot near Gretna. The ship was first spotted by Burns' colleague Walter Crawford, who attempted to seize it with a small group of men, only to discover that the brig was well armed. Crawford sent a note to Dumfries, asking for 24 dragoons while he would go and recruit a further 20 at Echel Fechen. Among the men brought to watch over the brig while the troops to seize it were gathered was newly promoted Robert Burns, now a supervisor of the Dumfries Port Division. Now, because of the distances involved in gathering men on horseback, Burns was left waiting for some time to watch over the Rosamond. It's been said that he grew quite impatient as he waited and was inspired to write the deals a wah with the exciseman by an offhand comment made from one of the men. A story is probably apocryphal, but what certainly was true is that the Rosamond was successfully captured. Unable to reach the ship by horse because of the quicksands, the excisemen tried to search the coast nearby for boats to board her with. The locals, of course, did all they good, could to hinder this, so they were eventually forced to make their attack on foot. They attacked in three groups, one to the fore, one to the aft, and the party under Burns command to the ship's broadside. Under fire from the big brig, the men were to wait until they were eight yards from the ship to begin firing their muskets before drawing swords. It didn't really get as far as fighting though, as by the time the excisemen and their dragoons were within a hundred yards of the ship, the crew ditched themselves into the sea and swam for England. The Rosamond had been empty of anything movable by the time the excisemen got to her. The Rosamond and her remaining contents were put up for sale at Dumfries Coffee House on the 19th of April 1792. As part of that sale, there were four small coronades or cannon that had been taken from the brig. Joseph Train, an exciseman stationed at Castle Douglas, passed all of the documents pertaining to the capture of the Rosamond to Sir Walter Scott. Among them, although subsequently lost, was supposed to have been a receipt for the coronades showing that Burns himself had bought them. The story then goes that he tried to send these to France to help with the revolution. Sir Walter Scott attempted to trace them to France, failed and contacted the customs house at Dover to see if they had any knowledge of them. They discovered the cannons had been seized at that port and did not ever make it to France. I think these stories of Robert Burns as an exciseman highlight some of the fascinating contradictions of his character. He worked for the government, but he bent the rules for those who really couldn't afford to be caught breaking them. He enjoyed the adventure of being in the fight against smugglers, but was happy to support radicals in France with weapons. And in spite of these contradictions, Burns remained in his post right up to his death in 1796.